Ok, parfait. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to present you uh, the first part of my thesis, uh, named uh, Bidding Efficiently in Simultaneous Ascending Auctions Using a Method Named Monte Carlo Tree Search. So, this work uh, has been proposed uh, by Marcel Kupchou uh, from LTC Telecom Paris, Aurélien Bechler uh, from Orange Labs, and myself. So why is it important to bid efficiently in simultaneous ascending auctions? So we'll name a SAA from now on. Uh, it's first uh, of practical importance uh, because SAA has become the privileged mechanism used for spectrum auctions since its introduction in 1994 by the Federal Communication Commission in the United States. For example, SAA has recently been used in uh, many countries uh, for the allocation of 5G uh, licenses, such as Germany, Portugal, Italy, or even in a slight different way, France. Theoretically, Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson received the Nobel Prize in Economy in 2020, mainly for their contributions to the mechanism design of SIA. However, even though uh, bidding efficiently uh, in SIA is of practical importance, especially considering the huge amount of money involved, uh, usually it's around uh, seven uh, billions of dollars. Only a little, we can uh, help noticing only a gap in literature regarding how to bid efficiently SIA. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the works which have been done on this subject uh, only focuses uh, on uh, the regulator's uh, point of view and not on the bidder's point of view. Auction theory or exact game resolution methods are unable to compute the optimal bidding strategies due to the high complexity of the game. Moreover, SIA presents a number of uh, strategical issues these issues have always been studied separately, generally in specific contexts and simplified versions of SAA. We propose uh, in this uh, presentation, a tree search approach to the bidder strategy problem, tackling simultaneously two of its main strategical issues, exposure and uh, own price effect. So uh, first, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to present to you uh, the specificities of uh, the SRA. Then I'll present to you a simplified uh, model of it and uh, its two main strategical issues, uh, which are exposure and own price effects. I'll then present to you a class of bidding strategies, uh, which corresponds to state of the art uh, of bidding in SRA and aims uh, to reduce the exposure. I'll then present to you uh, our algorithm, which is based on uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search, which tackles uh, both of these issues. Uh, through numerical experiments, uh, I'll confirm uh, that our algorithm uh, tackles indeed uh, both of these issues. And then I'll conclude uh, by mentioning eventual future works. So first, what is uh, SAA? So for you to understand what is SAA, uh, you first need to know what is an English auction. So I think you've all already seen once an English auction, uh, maybe in movies. It's basically when you've got an auctioneer who's uh, selling a painting in front of an audience uh, full of bidders, and each uh, bidder uh, raises its panel uh, to uh, bid on the item and acquire it. And at the end of the auction, the bidder who has placed uh, the highest bid uh, acquires as a painting. So uh, SAA is basically the same thing, but you've got M paintings, uh, which are sold uh, simultaneously in, uh, in M English auctions uh, between N bidders. So uh, bidding occurs in uh, multiple rounds. At each round, uh, bidders submit their bid simultaneously at the same time. Uh, activity rules uh, main constrain bidders uh, to play. They're not present in all SRA auctions, but you may have activity rules. 
Uh, this is done to avoid what is known as wait and see strategies. So these are strategies uh, where bidders wait uh, before uh, submitting their bids uh, to see how the auction progresses. Uh, for every item J, uh, the, bidding have, the bidder having placed the highest bid on it uh, becomes its temporary winner. Sometimes you can have uh, more uh, than two bidders uh, that submit the, the same highest bid. So in case of ties, uh, the temporary winner is uh, selected randomly among the, these bidders. And uh, the bid price PJ is set to the highest bid. The temporary winner and bid price of each item is revealed at the end of the turn. The minimal admissible bid for the next round is uh, the current bid price plus a uh, bid increment. The auction uh, continues until uh, a round uh, happens when uh, no new bids have been submitted on any object. Uh, this is the typical closing rule, but you can imagine others. At the end of the auction, uh, the objects are sold at the bid prices to the corresponding winners. We propose a simplified uh, version of uh, SAA that we name uh, DSAA, which stands for Deterministic SAA uh, with Complete Information. Uh, the major difference uh, between uh, both auctions is that the bidder takes turns bidding in DSAA. That means that bidders don't bid uh, simultaneously anymore. Uh, by doing so, uh, we eliminate uh, simultaneity and stochasticity from our problem. Uh, temporary winner and bid price are announced after each turn. Uh, new bids are constrained uh, to the current bid price uh, plus uh, the bid increment. Uh, this reduction of the bidding space is quite common and it makes uh, our action space uh, discrete. The value functions of the bidders are common knowledge. Uh, this last assumption is relevant in a spectrum auctions as generally bidders have a relatively precise estimation of uh, their opponent's value function. This makes a DSA uh, induces uh, a sequential deterministic game with perfect and complete information. However, uh, the game uh, remains still highly complex. Uh, two, two metrics are usually uh, used uh, in game uh, to define uh, its complexity. Uh, the first is the state space complexity and the second is the game tree complexity. So state space complexity uh, defines, means, uh, stands for the number of possible states uh, which can be reached uh, legally from the initial uh, state of the game. And uh, the game tree uh, complexity refers to the number of possible different sequences of action that can take place in the game. For example, uh, regarding uh, the auction, which took place in Italy in 2018, a state space complexity is 10 to the power of 35 and the game tree complexity is 10 to the power of 491, which is just uh, humongous uh, numbers and this show that uh, this game is really complex. A common representation of uh, sequential games is a tree representation that in game theory we call extensive form. Each node of the tree uh, corresponds to different states of the game and each edge in uh, our case corresponds to the different feasible bits. A state uh, of the game in uh, SRA and DSRA uh, is defined by the player to bid, by the current bid price of each item and their respective uh, temporary winner. We represent in this figure uh, the extensive form on the left of SAA and the extensive form of uh, DSAA on the right with the information sets and chance nodes. So what is an information set? An information set is a set of nodes, or nodes which can't be differentiated uh, by the player to bid. For example, in SAA, as the bidders uh, play simultaneously, the second bidder has no idea what uh, the first uh, bidder has bidded. For example, imagine we have uh, just one item in the auction. 
uh, the first bidder had a choice between bidding on the item, uh, which is the left edge, or not bidding on it. But the second player has no idea what the first bidder has just done, so he can't differentiate uh, these two nodes. So uh, this uh, corresponds to an information set. And for the third player, it's the same thing, as he has no idea what the first player or the second player has played. The chance nodes uh, corresponds uh, to the ties, uh, which are broken uh, randomly uh, in case that uh, two players submit uh, the same highest bid. In DSIA, as bidders uh, take turns uh, bidding, uh, information sets are singletons, as uh, each bidder knows exactly in which state he is, and we have no need for chance nodes, as uh, we don't need a tie breaking rule. The fact that uh, DSAA extensive form is way simpler than SAA enables us to conceive simpler to research algorithms in DSAA. Each player is defined by its value function, which respects uh, the three following uh, properties, normalization, uh, finite, and a uh, free disposal. Value functions uh, can admit uh, some specific properties, uh, such as uh, complements or uh, substitu substitutes. So a set of goods is said to be a complement uh, with another set of goods if the value for both sets, X and Y, is strictly greater than the value of the set of X plus the value of the set uh, of Y. If uh, the inequality is reversed, uh, we say that both sets of goods are substitutes. Uh, the utility uh, function uh, for player is defined uh, uh, for bundle at the value function uh, applied to this bundle minus uh, the price of uh, each item uh, belonging to the bundle. So what is uh, the exposure problem? The exposure problem refers to the possibility that by bidding on a set of complementary goods, a bidder ends up by paying more than its valuation for the subset, it actually wins, and the goods have become too expensive. This means that uh, the bidder ends up with a negative utility. To highlight this problem, uh, we're gonna use example one. So in example one, uh, we have an auction uh, between two players and uh, with two items. Uh, the first player uh, sees uh, each uh, item as substitutes. That means he values first item uh, at 12, second item at 12, but both items together also at 12. That means he has no interest in acquiring two items. He just wants to acquire one item. Player two sees uh, both items as perfect complement. This means that individually, uh, these items are worthless uh, from his point of view, but together uh, they are a value of 20. A rational strategy uh, for player one is to pass its turn if uh, he is currently uh, winning an item, or the bid price of both items is greater than 12 minus uh, epsilon, the bid increment. Otherwise, he should bid on the cheapest item. Given the fact that player one plays rationally, if player two bids on an item, he will end up exposed because either he will end up with one item and so uh, he have a negative utility, or he will acquire both item, but for a price greater than 22. No efficient bidding strategy is known to avoid this problem in the general case. So now what is own price effect? So own price effect uh, is defined by the fact that each bid on an item increases its price and decreases the utility of bidders willing to acquire it. Each bidder has then his own effect on the prices. A strategy to reduce uh, this issue is called demand reduction strategy and consists in uh, reducing uh, demand to keep prices low by uh, conceding uh, items uh, to the other bidders. And you have another form uh, which is called collusion, uh, which is by using a demand reduction strategy and consists in coordinating on how to split uh, the items uh, between bidders. This issue is highlighted in example two, uh, where we suppose that the bid increment is equal to one. 
So in this example, we have uh, two bidders uh, in an auction with two items. Uh, each bidder has the same value uh, function, which is additive, and uh, sees uh, values each item at 10. If players uh, in this example don't form a collusion, the final bid price of each item uh, will be 10 uh, because uh, people, uh, the, both players will keep rising the price. And so uh, both players will end up with a utility of zero. If players form a collusion, then they both acquire an item for a price uh, fixed at the bid increment, epsilon equals one, and end up uh, with a utility of nine. And now I'm going to present you uh, a class of bidding strategy uh, which aim to reduce uh, exposure and which corresponds uh, to the state of the art uh, in SAA. So uh, point price prediction bidding, uh, which we will name a PP uh, from now on, is a class of uh, strategies uh, which aims to reduce uh, exposure. Uh, point price uh, bidding uh, strategy uh, for the bidder, uh, point price uh, prediction bidder, uh, computes uh, the subset of goods uh, which uh, maximizes uh, its utility with respect uh, to an estimation of uh, final price uh, rule here, uh, breaking ties in favor of smaller subsets and lower number of goods. Every subset of good X uh, on which the AGMAX um, operator is applied contains all the items the bidder is temporarily winning. The bidder then uh, bids uh, the current bid price plus the bid increment on all items that he is not currently winning in X star. The um, function uh, rule uh, gives an estimation of the final uh, price vector and uses uh, for his update rule uh, only the initial estimation of a final price vector and uh, the current uh, bid price of each item. If uh, the bidder's initial estimation of final price is correct and the final prices of of the auction are independent of its bidding strategy, then playing PP with the correct final prices is optimal. However, if uh, the bidder overestimates too much uh, the final prices, it might uh, drop out of the auction prematurely. And if uh, the bidder underestimates too much uh, the final prices, he might uh, end up exposed. An extreme case of uh, PP is a well-known uh, straightforward uh, bidding strategy, which corresponds to a PP with the uh, initial estimation of the final price of each item of uh, zero. So he estimates that uh, all items are free at the beginning of the auction. So as uh, this uh, strategy uh, fully depends on its initial uh, estimation, how can we uh, obtain a good prediction of uh, the final price vector? So uh, you have uh, many uh, concepts uh, that uh, exist in the literature. One uh, which is quite well known is valuation equilibrium, uh, which I'm not gonna detail really now. Uh, the problem uh, with this concept is that it doesn't always exist in an auction. For example, in example one, uh, we haven't got any valuation equilibrium. So that's quite problematic. Nevertheless, uh, they can be computed uh, through a, a Tatanuman process named expected price equilibrium. The problem of this process is that it only uses uh, what is called a demand function, X, and this demand function doesn't take in account of the auctions mechanism. So actually uh, it returns uh, as final price vector the same thing in SRA, DSRA in a second uh, price auction. Uh, so that's quite also problematic. It doesn't take in account uh, the auction's uh, specificities. Another concept is uh, self-confirming point price prediction, 
which has been developed by Wellman. Uh, a self confirming point price prediction is a price vector P such that if all bidders play PP with initial estimation P, then the final price vector uh, of the auction is equal to P. However, uh, this concept doesn't always exist uh, for the same reason uh, than uh, valuation equilibrium, uh, but we can still compute them uh, using a fixed point process. So uh, for the moment, uh, we've seen a class of bidding uh, strategies uh, which aim uh, to reduce exposure. However, uh, no algorithm is yet uh, present in the literature to tackle simultaneously the exposure problem and the own price effect problem. So uh, today we're gonna to present the first algorithm uh, which uh, tackles both, which is based on a Monte Carlo uh, tree search method. So I think you all know what is Monte Carlo tree search, but uh, I'll may just explain it. So to understand it, uh, you need to know about the notion of a search tree. So uh, as you may imagine, uh, because of the complexity of the game, it is impossible uh, to explore the whole game tree. So we can only explore uh, a small portion of it uh, called search tree. In the case of uh, Monte Carlo tree search, uh, it is uh, constructed iteratively. So MCTS uh, builds the search tree by repeating a process uh, named uh, search situation. Uh, this process is divided into uh, four steps, four phases, uh, named selection, expansion, rollout, and backpropagation, and is run until some predefined computational budget is reached, uh, usually a memory uh, or a fixed number of iteration or time. So the first uh, phase of the search situation is selection, and it consists in uh, selecting a pass uh, in the search tree uh, from the root of the search tree to a leaf knot of the search tree using a selection strategy. So a leaf knot of the search tree is either a terminal node of the game or a node of the search tree which hasn't uh, uh, got all his uh, children uh, in the search tree yet. The expansion uh, step consists of adding a node of this leaf node uh, in the search tree, which hasn't been expanded yet. So we just, in the expansion step, we just add a new node to the search tree. The rollout phase uh, consists in uh, simulating a game from uh, this new allied node. And uh, the backpropagation step uh, consists in uh, backpropagating uh, the results of the rollout step uh, to update uh, the statistics of the nodes uh, selected uh, in the selection steps. So uh, we, ju we just update the statistics uh, here uh, using uh, the results obtained in the rollout phase. So uh, this method uh, obtained uh, great, uh, achieved great success, especially in two player zero sum uh, deterministic games. The main reason uh, for this is first that uh, theoretically it has been uh, proven that the probability of playing a suboptimal action with a variant of SATS uh, named UCT uh, converges to zero at polynomial rate at the number of search situations close to infinity. So that means uh, that if we uh, have an infinity number of search situations, then uh, our MCTS uh, returns the optimal uh, action uh, to play. Practically, uh, it has received and had great success in many, many games, uh, being in the state of the art algorithm in games such as X, uh, Go, or Otello. But I think MCTS is especially well known now uh, due to an algorithm which is called AlphaGo which was uh, developed uh, by uh, DeepMind and uh, which uh, beat uh, the world champion of Go 4-1, uh, uh, Lee Sidol, in uh, March uh, 2016. 
However, uh, the game that we are studying uh, now uh, isn't a two-player zero-sum deterministic game, but is a n-player non-zero-sum game. So uh, the theoretical guarantee uh, that we just mentioned uh, doesn't stand uh, in our game. We decide to implement uh, MCTS uh, max n uh, variant uh, in our game, which is the most popular uh, variant of MCTS uh, for end player games. So um, our selection uh, strategy uh, uses a penalized variant of uh, UCT. So apparent not uh, why our selection strategy uh, chooses uh, the child X uh, with uh, the higher score uh, QX. So the first term here corresponds uh, to the exploitation term of uh, the uh, selection index of UCT. The second term corresponds uh, to the exploration term of uh, the selection index of uh, UCT. An, explo an exploration factor is used to make the trade-off uh, between uh, exploitation and exploration, uh, because you may have, have heard of uh, the exploitation exploration dilemma. So this uh, factor is uh, done uh, to make the trade-off. But usually, uh, we use a fixed uh, coefficient, uh, which represents the size of the reward support. However, in our game, uh, the reward support is unknown, so we must estimate it. And we estimate it uh, by uh, taking the maximum between Bx minus Ix and the bid increment epsilon. The two last terms are penalties, uh, which are added uh, to our selection strategy uh, to enhance our model and reduce exposure. So the objective of uh, the first penalty term is to discourage bidders to pass their turn if they have got nothing to lose by bidding on an additional item. So if uh, the bidder playing at the parent node ends up at child node X with only an undesired set of items, then the penalty no object X is equal to the maximum surplus that the bidder could obtain by adding just an additional item uh, to uh, this undesired uh, set of items. So what is an uh, unde undesired set of items is just a set where none of uh, the opponents of the bidders have any interest in acquiring an item of it uh, given the current uh, bid price because uh, it's too expensive for them. Uh, the second penalty term uh, has for objective to deter players from bidding on sets of goods which might uh, lead to exposure. So a set of goods is said to uh, lead to exposure for bidder I if it contains a subset of goods that gives bidder I a negative utility at the current bid price. If uh, the sets of goods obtained at channel node X uh, leads to exposure for the bidder uh, bidding at the parent node, then uh, the selection index is penalized uh, by lambda times uh, scaling factor, uh, which is equal to the value of all items. So uh, lambda is different uh, depending if uh, the parent node uh, bidder is the root player or if it's an opponent the root player. Uh, that is done because it has opposite effects on the algorithm uh, risk aversion. For example, if uh, the um, parent node bidder is the root player, the higher lambda is, the less the root player is likely to bid on sets of goods which might lead to exposure. However, uh, if uh, the parent node bidder is an, um, an opponent uh, to the root node, the higher lambda is, the higher the root player's opponents are perceived as risk averse, and the more risky bids uh, since beneficial uh, for the root player. So um, 
usually uh, for uh, the rollout phase uh, where we simulate uh, a playoff game, uh, the default rollout strategy is to play randomly. However, in our case, in the SAA, it leads to absurd outcomes uh, with potentially very high prices. So we decide to use another strategy, uh, which is uh, PP uh, that chooses a new method to estimate uh, the final price vector. Uh, it is, uh, um, we use uh, the limits of uh, this sequence uh, where FP, the final price vector, obtained when all players play PP with initial prediction P. However, uh, for the moment, we've only been able uh, to prove uh, the convergence of uh, the sequence in specific uh, contexts. Uh, so uh, for the moment, we conjecture the convergence of uh, this sequence in the general case. Before uh, running our MCTS, uh, we compute uh, the above uh, conjectured uh, limit. And uh, then at the beginning of each rollout phase, we set uh, the initial estimation of our PP strategy uh, to the conjectured limit plus a random variable. So in fact, we add noise to our initial estimation to uh, diverse uh, results obtained in our rollout phase uh, and improve uh, the sampling of our algorithm. So um, now we're gonna have a look uh, at the numerical results uh, to confirm that our algorithms indeed tackles uh, own price effect and exposure. So first, I'm just going to discuss uh, quickly uh, the simulation settings. So uh, the hyperparameters uh, used for our MCTS are lambda R and lambda O. They are both equal to uh, 0 0.07, and they were found uh, by uh, grid search. Uh, in uh, these experiments, uh, we compare our algorithms uh, to five other strategies, uh, the straightforward building strategy. Uh, EPE, uh, which is PP uh, and uses uh, the valuation equilibrium as uh, initial estimation. SCPD is uh, a strategy which is quite similar to PP uh, using uh, this uh, self confirming uh, point per uh, prediction that we saw earlier. So it's a very similar strategy. Uh, UCB is a bounded uh, algorithm. Uh, where uh, the rewards are computed uh, using uh, our rollout phase uh, of our MCTS. Its selection index uh, doesn't take in account our selection penalties. And uh, afterwards, we've also uh, used uh, another MCTS, but without uh, our uh, selection penalties. So uh, the rollout phase is the same. Each algorithm is given a maximum of uh, 30 seconds uh, CPU syncing time. So uh, we're gonna first see uh, two test experiments, uh, one for exposure, uh, one uh, for end price effect. So uh, the first test experiment uh, regards exposure and it's example one uh, that I've uh, already shown. In this case, our MCTS, uh, our MCTS without uh, the selection uh, penalties, the banded algorithm and EPE all suggest uh, player two not to bid and hence avoids exposure. However, SB and SCPD expose player two by inciting him uh, to bid on both items. So uh, from using this example, we can see that at least in a simple environments, our algorithm is capable of avoiding uh, obvious exposure. Uh, for uh, a test experiment regarding own price effect, uh, we take an auction uh, with two items and two players. Uh, both players have an additive uh, value function and the first player uh, C values uh, each item at H and the second player values each item at L. L is uh, smaller than H 
And we suppose that the bin increment is infinitesimal. If h is uh, smaller than 2h uh, minus l, player one should bin on both items until player two drops out because you will obtain an, an uh, utility of uh, 2h minus l. So he will maximize his utility by doing that. If uh, the inequality is reversed, then player one should form a collusion with player two by conceding an item. So he obtains uh, afterwards a uh, utility of uh, h instead of two uh, h minus l. Player two optimal strategy uh, is quite obvious. He should bid on uh, the cheapest item if its bid price is lower than L minus uh, the bid increment, and if he is currently winning no item. Otherwise, he should pass. So on this figure, uh, we have uh, plotted uh, the evolution of players one utility uh, sigma one, depending on strategy, versus player two's valuation L in uh, the experiments I've just uh, described, uh, given the fact that player two plays optimally. Uh, h, uh, the value uh, h uh, is equal to 10 in this experiment. So uh, what we can see in this experiment is that uh, when L is uh, smaller than five, uh, player one uh, should bid on uh, both items. And this is done uh, by uh, the five algorithms, MC MCTS, SB, UCB, EP, and SCPD. However, when L is greater to five, uh, the algorithms should suggest uh, to a player one to concede an item. However, uh, this is not done uh, by the four different uh, strategies, SB, UCB, EP, and SCPD, uh, which uh, suggest to continue bidding on both items. So they're not capable of adapting uh, uh, the right strategy, uh, even when it is highly beneficial. However, uh, our algorithm, uh, MCTS, uh, adapts uh, the appropriate strategy uh, by using a demand reduction strategy in this case. Uh, this shows in, in this example that uh, algorithm is capable of tackling own price effect, at least uh, in simple environments. So uh, now uh, we're going to look at uh, a bit more extensive experiment. Uh, so we've won a thousand uh, DSAA uh, different instances uh, with N, the number of bidders equal to two, M, the number of items equal to seven, and uh, epsilon, the bid, bid increment, uh, equal to one. Value functions are generated randomly, uh, respecting uh, the three properties, uh, finite, uh, free uh, disposal, and normalization. Uh, in this slide, uh, we use uh, the same empirical uh, game analysis approach uh, than Wellman. Uh, this consists in studying uh, the symmetric normal game an expected payoff where each player has a choice between uh, using our MCTI strategy or another specified strategy A. For example, in the figure uh, here in the top left, uh, the bidder, each bidder has a choice between uh, either using MCTS, our strategy, or UCB. If uh, both players, uh, both bidders uh, use the UCB strategy, then uh, the average uh, payoff is around six. If a uh, player use MCTS and the other player use UCB, then uh, the average payoff for the MCTS player is around uh, 14. The average uh, payoff for the other uh, player is, 11, is around 11. And if uh, both uh, players uh, use MCTS, then the average payoff is of 15. What we can see is that in this example, each player has interest in deviating to uh, the MCTS uh, strategy uh, because it is uh, more profitable. And uh, this can be generalized uh, to the five figures uh, where we see the same, same thing. And uh, because 
each uh, strategy, UCB, SB, EP, SCPD, OMCTS, uh, with, uh, without uh, the penalty selections, uh, won't have an interest in deviating to our MCTS strategy, then we can say that the profile MCTS, MCTS is the only pure Nash equilibrium of the normal form game and expected payoff with uh, these six, six strategies. So uh, every player should play our strategy in this case. Uh, to analyze the own price effects, uh, we have plotted uh, in the left figure, uh, the average uh, price per item one, but each strategy against every strategy displayed on the X axis. So uh, basically what we see here in orange is uh, the average price paid uh, by our MCTS strategy. For example, uh, against MCTS, uh, it's equal to 1.1. And for example, red is uh, SB, uh, the average price paid uh, per item one by SB. For example, SB against an MCTS player uh, pays an average per item one, uh, 3.5. And what we can see in this graph is that uh, in each uh, subgraph, uh, the orange bar is always uh, the lowest. Uh, that means that our MCTS obtained the lowest average price per item one against every strategy. However, uh, this result could just be just due to the fact that uh, our MCTS strategy only acquires uh, undesired items at a reasonably uh, low price. To ensure that it isn't the case, we complement uh, the previous metric by using uh, the average uh, numbers of items one per auction. And uh, our MCTS strategy is still represented in orange. And what we can see is against uh, uh, every other strategy except SB, our MCTS uh, wins around uh, three items out of the seven items in the auction, which uh, show that uh, our MCTS is fairly competitive and uh, only 1.6 against uh, SB. So uh, this shows that uh, our, the second uh, figure shows that uh, our MCTS is fairly competitive and doesn't just bid on undesired items. So through uh, this uh, example, uh, we can show that our MCTS indeed uh, tackles the end price effect. Uh, to uh, analyze the exposure, uh, we have plotted on the left uh, the exposure frequency of each strategy against every strategy uh, displayed on uh, the X axis. And on the right, uh, the cumulative loss uh, in the logarithmic uh, scale. So uh, first, what we can see on uh, the left uh, figure is that uh, the profile uh, MCTS, MCTS uh, never uh, suffers from exposure. That means that if two players play MCTS, uh, they won't uh, get exposed. So this is quite uh, remarkable. Uh, the other things that we can see is that uh, MCTS has a most 1.2% uh, chance of getting exposed against every other strategy uh, except a straightforward bidding, SB. Um, but against SB, it is a strategy uh, which uh, is less exposed, so it's still uh, good. And uh, these results are confirmed uh, by uh, the cumulative uh, loss. Uh, I just forgot to say, but the exposure frequency, uh, we use this metric uh, to estimate uh, the probability of getting exposed. And the cumulative loss is uh, used uh, to uh, measure the magnitude of losses uh, due to exposure. Um, and uh, finally, what we can see, and which is really important, is that uh, our selection penalties uh, considerably uh, reduces exposure. Uh, for instance, uh, our MCTS is exposed less than 96%, uh, 63%, 40% uh, than MCTS uh, without the selection penalties, 
respectively against uh, EP, SCPD, and SB. And our MCTS uh, strategy uh, generates 67%, 61%, 37% less losses uh, than the MCTS uh, without, um, oh, it's written two times, uh, without uh, the selection strategies against respectively EP, SCPD, and SB. To conclude, uh, our algorithm is the first algorithm which tackles simultaneously the exposure problem and the end price effect in any simplified version of SRA. Uh, we think that uh, our MCTS is a promising approach uh, to derive auction strategies in SAA. Uh, complementary works uh, show uh, that our algorithm is e easily extended uh, to budget constraints and obtains uh, really good results in this type of environment. Our algorithm uh, remains efficient and robust uh, to significant errors in the valuation estimates. So this can be used uh, in the case that uh, our estimation are not uh, as precise as uh, we think. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are increasing uh, the number of players in the games and have added simultaneity uh, to the game. Uh, but uh, what we need to do uh, now is uh, to work with uh, incomplete information and adding it to it uh, to our SAA model. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, here's my mail if you've got any questions or articles that you think uh, might be interesting uh, related to uh, my subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question? On the bridge? Or in the room? Yeah, I have some questions. Yeah. So uh, for your um, for the functions that you are actually designing, mm -hmm. there to be a lot of uh, thinking on the ad hoc uh, kind of uh, function construction. So I, I was wondering if uh, one could try to tune a little bit further, uh, for example, the, the weight of the uh, of the negative feedback function. Uh, then, then, uh, then here's the last bit, uh, the negative feedback of... Uh... Yes, so can you, can you put back the, the slide where you put the, the complete functions that you have been using for the reward? For the, for the reward? Of, so the value functions? Yes. Yeah, here. Uh, next, next, next one. Again, no, no. Well, you've got, you know, uh, no player and uh, things like that. No player? Uh, next. Next. Yeah. This, yeah, one. this one. Okay, it's yes. the selection index. Okay, of, uh, okay, so, the MCTS. So, so this one looks like uh, cooked up, uh, but we don't really know whether it would be possible to further improve it, like by adding some weight to no object or to risky move, uh, to max, uh, blah, blah, et cetera. So. Uh, yeah, I agree with you afterwards, yeah. Um, in risky move, you've got two hyperparameters, uh, lambda R, lambda O, uh, which are tuned. Uh, so, uh, so for whiskey move, uh, it should work. But yeah, I could add a, um, a parameter uh, for no object. That's what you want to say. Uh, to uh, parameters to have a linear combination of each uh, factor and tune them. That's it. Yes, like tuning parameters, but also maybe there could be some other kind of function that would work as well. And uh, I didn't quite grasp whether there was a, a systematic approach to designing those functions. Uh, so uh, in MCTS, uh, you have off, well, you've been in many games, you've got an approach. So you, this, uh, the first term, two terms uh, come from Hoffeding inequality. 
And uh, so they are used in nearly uh, every MCTS for the selection okay. index. Okay. And uh, what is often used, uh, well, this is a bit different because normally you know the reward support, so there we estimate it. But it's basically the same thing. And so you've got properties uh, on this one. And afterwards, what is uh, often done is uh, to uh, add penalties uh, because you know uh, information about the game and you know that some moves are better than others. And so you're trying to uh, drive uh, your algorithm in a, in a path, uh, in a path that you think is going to have uh, good moves. So in this case, is uh, choosing moves uh, which uh, don't lead to exposure. OK. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? I have one on one of your last slides, uh, 27. 27? Yeah, this one. So it's about the exposure. So, uh, what is strange for me uh, is the fact that in terms of exposure frequency, you are very close to zero for MTS and CTS uh, against uh, several uh, strategies, but you yeah. still have cumulative loss. Uh, is there a reason for that? Uh, yes, because it doesn't mean uh, I, um, I put these two metrics because they are complementary, uh, because the exposure frequency uh, estimates as a probability of getting exposed, but you can imagine some uh, situations where I have, uh, I'm, I'm nearly uh, never exposed, but when I get exposed, I'm, uh, I, I lose a lot. Uh, so uh, it's uh, just to see that uh, when I'm exposed, uh, my loss uh, is bounded, basically. So then uh, uh, with your answer, there's a question in my mind. Uh, is the cumulative loss uh, the right uh, yeah. uh, the, 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 the right uh, parameter? Yeah. Check? Maybe uh, uh, someone would like to avoid to have very very high loss, uh, so a kind of max instead of average or something like that. And so it is cumulative, so it's different, difficult for me to to, to see the, to, to to say the things. But uh, if you have a, a probability of almost zero, but then if it happens, you have a very high loss. This maybe would like the, the people would like to avoid that. Yeah, so, yeah, that's uh, it. Um, but we haven't got a high loss, so it's a logarithmic uh, scale. That's why it, it, it looks big. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah. I would have like, I think I would have need to, to read more about, about this to understand better. But uh, it was strange for me to have zero uh, on one side and uh, still some not negligible losses uh, on the uh, other uh, I mean, it's um, here, I mean, MCTS is uh, exposed uh, zero uh, against MCTS, against uh, this MCTS, but otherwise, otherwise is, you ju I just said it was. Uh, at but most 1.2, so that's normal. You've got cumulative loss, you've got a bit of loss there. You still have loss, but it's uh, yeah, okay. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. 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 Okay.